Uh, so before we get into our sort of lecture material where I'm going to sort of run through um, again several perspectives that we're going to encounter in the readings and um, and just provide some of that background. You may have noticed by the way the slides are going to get wordier. Um, that's because they're I'm really thinking of them even more so as a resource for you rather than something to engage with in an actual classroom setting. Um, so while you know I think you know, the slides tended to be less wordy when we met in person because um, I, you know, I wanted to focus on having a conversation and, and uh, a, a back and forth and just use the, the slides as sort of other kinds of reminders. Um, I recognize now that you're going to go back to these uh, in a different kind of way. So uh, again, don't freak out. Um, you, can, <laughs> you can return to them whenever you like. Um, yeah, but again, for this week, uh, for reading, we're looking at chapter 28, The Unraveling. So we're heading into um, a really uh, confusing period for many Americans. Uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, politics becomes more polarized, the Vietnam War drags on, and uh, a president uh, for the first and so far only time in US history um, resigns with the looming threat of impeachment. Um, so it's a pretty intense time period yet again. We also have some uh, documents in the reader I'd like you to look at from uh, Vietnam as we sort of wrap up our, our discussion of the Vietnam War. One of them is obviously much earlier. It's Ho Chi Minh's Declaration of Independence from 1945. Uh, again, just a sort of a reminder um, for those of you who maybe watched the first episode of the Vietnam War as extra credit, Recall that, um, uh, you know, from many perspectives, the, you know, the uh, independence is the the goal uh, early on, and and for many Vietnamese throughout, that it's an anti-imperial conflict rather than a Cold War conflict. Um, and also some uh, there are also some uh, memories from uh, veterans, including former Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh, also, later in the week, I'd like you to, to skim through as, as best you can, look at the Sorensen memo um, on presidential, presidential succession and impeachment. Um, so, of the many weird twists and turns of, of Watergate and Nixon's near impeachment was the fact that he almost got impeached without a vice president. Um, his vice president had, um, had already been impeached. Um, <laughs> Uh, for separate issues with respect to, you know, fraud in Maryland um, and had stepped down. So there was a period of time where the Nixon and Nixon looked like he might, you know, an impeachment might go to the House and, and Senate um, before Gerald Ford could be confirmed as vice president. And that's the weird period that this memo comes out of. Sorensen was a, a Democratic um, uh, uh, advisor, because um, the weird thing that would have happened, so if you, if you know your order of succession, um, you will know that the, if there is no vice president or the vice president cannot for some reason um, take on the presidency, uh, the next person in, in the chain of command or, or the next person in the line uh, is the Speaker of the House, <laughs> um, which would have been a very delicate situation. Um, Nixon was a Republican. Uh, the Speaker of the House was still uh, uh, Democrat uh, Carl Albert, who uh, we read a quote from last time. Um, so this idea of you know, trying to be very careful about how that how that process would have worked. Mm. It did not have to did not happen that way. Of course, Ford was um, pretty quickly confirmed by the Senate, and we had a Vice President. Um, but there is this period where something very weird could have happened. Um, if any of you are fans of the West Wing, I think it's in season four, they basically have this same plot point happen where the you know, Speaker of the House from the opposite party temporarily becomes uh, president. It might be season five, anyhow. Um, so if you want a fictional version of the complications, uh, you can find it. Um, I also have a, a film that's not extra credit, one that I really want you to, to take the effort to watch this week, and that's All the President's Men, um, which is about breaking the Watergate story. It follows two journalists at the Washington Post 
um, who figured out what was what was going on and the extent of um, sort of surveillance uh, going on in the White House. It is long, um, so do feel free to break it up. Um, it should be on Swank Digital Campus. There's a link to it on Google Classroom. Um, you know, feel free to watch it in pieces. If you're a fan of movies about journalism, uh, this is sort of the one of the sort of foundational um, pieces in the genre that include, you know, of that it, the genre that includes more recent films like The Post or um, Spotlight. Uh, okay, a forum as usual on Friday on chapter 28, other class readings, the film, anything that uh, from this week that you'd like to discuss more. Questions by Andrew, Annalie, Cyrus, Emily, John, Mary Kate, Riley, and Wade. Um, and then again, as, as Luke asked about the, the debating the ERA activity, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do a Zoom. <laughs> Um, I think that was too ambitious, um, but do look for group assignments later today. And again, I'm just coming up with a list of talking points and arguments that are reflective of the figure you're assigned. Um, so again, what maybe preparation would look like if we were having an actual debate. Um, or you could imagine it as if you were, um, say, staff for one of these political figures, you know, helping them prepare for an actual debate. Um, but again, nothing too strenuous, just a, a document with those sort of clear points on them. I'm just looking to, to see that you understand what their arguments would have been. Reflection, uh, then we have uh, reflection five, our last reflection paper, which is due on Friday. Um, and you can discuss any of the uh, sort of Cold War global interventions that we've talked about. You can look at the brands reading. Um, <clears throat> You can focus on some of the primary sources about the Vietnam War um, or textbook discussions of interventions in Latin America and the Middle East. Um, so that's all fair game. Just again, I ask you to focus on, you know, one thing um, and put it in context. Please don't try to do all of this. Um, we'll have another quiz posted Friday, due Sunday. Um, looks like that worked pretty well. Um, I graded the half that were done relatively early uh, yesterday. Um, looks like, uh, for the most part, um, you guys are, are doing really well in the quizzes. Um, as always, just make sure that you are answering the question fully. Uh, sometimes they are two-part questions, so make sure you're answering all parts of the question. Um, and again, having, having examples uh, to back up your conclusions is always helpful. We also have two extra credit films this week, uh, 1974's Chinatown, which is on Swank Digital Campus. Um, it's, uh, it's a noir film that sort of set, takes place in the past, but as, as it was when we looked at, say, The Twilight Zone, and we will when we look at other uh, examples of science fiction, this sort of neo-noir is also looking at um, reflecting issues that were um, prep present in the mid 1970s, um, including concerns over environmental regulations, as well as, um, <clears throat> as well as, um, you know, trust in government, and the, or lack of trust in government during the Watergate era. And finally, we have a, another documentary from uh, the American Experience series on the Stonewall Uprising in 1969 and the beginning of the gay rights movement. Okay, on to context. So to get us all sort of thinking, uh, heading into to class today, I just want to take a couple minutes um, for you all to brainstorm uh, about Nixon's win. Um, so 1968, end of that crazy year, um, Richard Nixon um, is elected president of the United States. If you will recall, he also ran for president in 1960 against John F. Kennedy. Um, so what had changed in the United States? What do you think led to Nixon being successful in 68 where he wasn't in 1960? Well, no, I mean, it's, it's a fair point as well. His, his, his opponent could have been Robert Kennedy if, if Robert Kennedy had not been assassinated after the California primary. Um, so yeah, um, 
there is there are certainly personal issues. Um, he's running against Hubert Humphrey, who was a pro-war Democrat and Johnson's VP at a point where, where Johnson's approval was at sort of an all-time low over his handling of Vietnam. So that's you know definitely uh, advantage Nixon. I think. Yeah, no, in 1960, there's a lot um, of discussion about the tele, you know, how the debates were televised. Um, and uh, there was like a poll done uh, during the debate and um, people who watched it on television uh, thought that Kennedy won the debate. Uh, people that listened to it on the radio thought it was a tie. Um, in part because, yeah, because of, you know, Kennedy just did better on camera. Anything else? What was going on maybe in the country that might have? Absolutely, yeah. So the Democrats were not, you know, unified um, during during this. Uh, be, there was a big break between the anti-war movement um, and uh, those that sort of wanted to continue prosecuting the war or, or supporting the president, um, leading to riots in Chicago. Definitely not good. And you know, maybe if you were someone who was was undecided watching riots break out over uh, a, a, a nominating convention, not exactly something that's going to sort of instill um, trust. Um, absolutely, and, and a lot of people were really, you know, the, the country really felt like it was at a breaking point. Um, it was heavily polarized. 1968 was a violent year um, across the globe, um, or the, um, not only were there riots in the U.S. After, and Chicago um, <clears throat> because of the uh, convention, but there were also, you know, there were also riots um, in cities um, after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., um, the, the, a more militant uh, anti-war movement, a more militant um, uh, Black power movement as well. Uh, and many, particularly suburban people, were frightened by that, particularly suburban white people. Um, so there's sort of a desire to try to calm things down, return to a more conservative status quo. All right, and 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 Nixon could be very appealing <laughs> as that kind of a as a sort of stabilizing force in that way. So if we look at the electoral map. Um, we can see that uh, Nixon won a majority of the, the electoral vote. He did not win a majority of the popular vote, as is often the case uh, in presidential contests, particularly when you have an un, uh, unusually strong uh, third party candidate, uh, which we, we, we do need to address somewhat. So there is a pretty strong third party showing by Alabama Governor George Wallace. Um, running as a quote American independent. Um, anybody have uh, know anything about George Wallace or remember anything about him? Just curious. so so if you if you if you have um, you know seen the the video there, there's sort of this infamous video clip of of Wallace uh, standing. I think he's at the University of Alabama. Um, saying, uh, you know, segregation now, segregation forever. Uh, that's him. Um, <clears throat> so Wallace was running explicitly as a segregationist, um, as someone who wanted to roll back uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, so that's where, that's where he's coming from, um, this idea of <clears throat> the idea that the civil rights movement had gone too far. Um, meanwhile, uh, Nixon was also trying to do better in the South. If you'll recall, you know, from the end of the Civil War, or frankly, right before the Civil War, um, through the middle of the 20th century, most white Southerners voted Republican, re re or voted Demo Democratic, excuse me. <laughs> uh, Democrats referred to the South as the Solid South um, throughout this period. Um, and changing ideas about the war and about segregation um, started to break that down um, as and and a shift towards the Republican Party um, as we sort of get the stronger polarization between conservative and liberal um, between the Democratic and uh, Republican bases. 
um, this started in 1964 um, when Republican Barry Goldwater won several Southern states, um, which was unprecedented. Um, and continued during this period, I mean, aside from the, the Wallace states, um, with Nixon taking areas that would have been states that would have been unheard of um, decades before, like South Carolina, Florida. <clears throat> um, and in part, that is because of something that we're kind of referred to as the Southern strategy, um, which used code words, what we might refer to as dog whistles. Um, to indicate that he wasn't going to let civil rights continue. Usually that, that the most common phrase for this was law and order. Um, so uh, the idea that you, you wouldn't tolerate sort of like demonstrations, that the, that the federal government was not going to get involved um, with things happening uh, in the South. That same language was increasingly appealing to more conservative um, suburbanites as well, who were concerned about, um, about rioting, which they also tended to associate with uh, African Americans, um, or crazy, or, or pro war, pro, or war protesters. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> or uh, the or increasing uh, individual rights, um, a, you know, concern about the Supreme Court being too liberal. Um, which was inc just increased further um, and, and continued this polarization through the 1970s um, with decisions on, for example, abortion and also with the rights of the incarcerated. Nixon also ran with the slogan, peace with honor. So he actively wanted to change the way the Cold War um, would be run. And this is best summarized with the Nixon Doctrine. This is a view towards coexistence with the Soviet Union and China. So say, acknowledging that there would be both capitalist and communist powers going forward. Um, and that they could secure peace through cooperation and alliances rather than coercion. So in some ways, getting back to a good neighbor policy, um, supporting those who um, are, are positively inclined towards the United States, both in Latin America and also increasingly, uh, as evidenced by this picture here, uh, in the Middle East. Um, so Middle Eastern countries start to become, again, sort of a um, part of the Cold War calculus, um, who's getting what kind of um, influence and power over, again, in many cases, new countries after decolonization, as, um, for example, Britain and France moved out of, of the Middle East, um, sort of leaving um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the uh, space for influence by the, the United States or the Soviet Union. And also the idea that the United States would not involve ground troops in proxy wars uh, anymore in third world countries. Um, just a sidebar, again, a reminder that when we're talking about the third world in the Cold War context, we're talking about something um, very specific, although now it's um, you know, sometimes a derogatory term uh, for developing nations, developing economies. In this period, it also, um, uh, is sort of important for the Cold War chess so chess game. So the, the first world is the United States and its NATO allies. The second world is the USSR and the Warsaw Pact nations. And everybody else is the third world, everybody who's unaligned. So remember, this is sort of a, a debate uh, trying to control these unaligned countries. <clears throat> Um, and there are some examples of the Nixon Doctrine uh, doing what it set out to do. Um, uh, Nixon was the first U.S. president to visit communist China in 1971. He visited the USSR in 1972, all uh, sort of these diplomatic trips to try to reduce tensions, uh, move away from the possibility of actual war between these large nations. Uh, he signed an anti-ballistic missiles treaty and SALT-1 treaty with the USSR in 1972 as well, connected with that trip, uh, which reduced the threat of nuclear war between the superpowers by um, reducing the number of missiles or reducing production capacity of nuclear weapons. And we also see the beginning of exchange programs between Eastern and Western countries. Um, they used to the, the 
uh, form of say like student study abroad programs, student exchange programs, uh, also allowing scholars to cross borders as well. It's not super open easy for people to, to make those trips, but it does start to become possible. On the other hand, um, there are places where the Nixon Doctrine certainly failed uh, in its initiatives or was ignored. Um, uh, ignored, failed, or you know, sort of problematic dark sides of it as well. It's not all about um, taking trips to China to play ping pong. Um, there's the problematic leg legacy of Vietnamization between 1971 and 1973. Um, the idea was to have um, an increasing amount of the actual fighting in Vietnam be done by South Vietnamese troops um, and slowly move uh, the U.S. out. Um, this, you know, this, this really wasn't possible. The South Vietnamese army was not in a position to really entirely take over um, control of, of the war. It escalated to an extent that it was, it was too much. Um, and eventually South Vietnam was not able to resist Northern and Viet Cong forces. And Saigon fell in, uh, in a really chaotic period um, in 1975, um, sort of immortalized again um, by television and film coverage uh, of the event of people sort of being evacuated by helicopters suddenly out of the American embassy. Um, a lot of, you know, real, a lot of concern about what would happen for those who were seen to collaborate with, with the United States or the South Vietnamese government. Uh, Nixon also started arms sales to Iran, which drove up oil prices um, <clears throat> at a time when Americans are having trouble affording oil. Um, and also, uh, you know, selling arms to the, the unpopular Shah really didn't do much to, you know, make the United States uh, a be in a positive way by the Iranian people, as we'll see at the end of the 1970s with the Iranian Civil War. Or Iranian Revolution, excuse me. Um, also, the Nixon Doctrine did not apply retroactively. There were still troops in Vietnam. Nixon actually increased the number of ground troops early in his presidency, and he escalated um, conf uh, the conflict in Laos and Cambodia um, to try to put more pressure on the North Vietnamese by expanding the war um, and attacking um, supply, what were assumed to be supply lines from North Vietnam and China through Laos and Cambodia uh, to South Vietnam, uh, the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail. This led to, um, de this destabilized both Laos and Cambodia, led to uh, very high civilian casualties, um, and uh, the kind of instability that, that allows for brutal um, repressive regimes to rise like that of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, um, which is responsible for the deaths of up to 2 million Cambodians uh, in the late 1970s. And finally, uh, this is the period of the covert operation um, uh, using the CIA or um, sort of proxy operatives trained in the United States um, <clears throat> to control politics in other countries. Most notably um, in Latin America, uh, many of these operations involve sort of overthrowing governments um, or in supporting dictator, friendly dictatorships in Latin America, um, notably the 1973 military coup in Chile, um, supported by American CIA operatives to overthrow a democratically elected um, but socialist um, uh, president in Chile. Um, also, Operation Condor, in which U.S. the United States backed uh, secret assassinations of left-wing uh, Latin American expatriates in, in the United States and Europe. Um, and again, financial and material support for pro-American but dictatorial regimes um, throughout the world, especially in Latin America and the Middle East. All right, so a quick shift uh, with the time we have left from foreign policy to domestic policy. Um, the social movements of the 1960s continued uh, into the 1970s. Um, and some really uh, uh, get started sort of at, uh, at this moment as well. Um, for example, the gay rights movement, the gay liberation movement uh, is often tied to the 1969 demonstrations at the Stonewall Inn, um, which started after the Stonewall a, um, a bar 
in Greenwich Village in New York City was raided by the police, um, <clears throat> leading to, uh, again, to, to demonstrations um, by gay rights activists um, and bringing additional um, attention to the movement. Um, and starting to try to break down, like with other, um, <clears throat> other groups that had been uh, systematically and historically marginalized, um, uh, gay and lesbian people started to um, demand their rights uh, and, and non-discrimination as well. Um, and to, an, to an additional uh, extent as well, uh, trans people, although trans people were at this point sometimes marginalized often, uh, from sort of the mainstream uh, gay liberation movement. <clears throat> um, one example of sort of one of the, the structural changes that was fought for and, and successfully completed um, during this period was to um, <clears throat> acknowledge that same, change the idea that same-sex attraction was um, somehow pathological. Um, so starting in, the starting in the late 19th century and codified in the 1950s with the first of the diagnostic and statistical manuals, the American psychiatric community uh, considered same-sex attraction to be uh, a disease, that it was some sort of psychiatric condition um, and needed to be treated as a disease, sometimes um, pretty brutally. Um, in 1973, after a lot of lobbying, including by um, a small uh, but increasingly vocal number of psychiatrists who came out during this period, um, the, the uh, APA voted to remove homosexuality from the DSM in 1973 and to acknowledge uh, same-sex attractions as part of a normal spectrum of human sexual behavior. Although it should be noted, it was not fully removed um, until a new edition um, in 1987. Um, but again, sort of an example of one of these structural changes um, uh, that occurred within communities. Uh, the feminist movement continued as well um, with the so-called sex wars, um, uh, starting in 1973. Um, increasingly, uh, uh, with an increasing focus on, on topics that are, were considered controversial or indeed in the case of abortion still considered controversial politically. Uh, so the 1973 decision Roe v. Wade, which argued that women had the right to an abortion in the first two trimesters um, <clears throat> uh, based on a right to privacy. Um, so focusing on sort of an implicit right to privacy in, in the Constitution. Um, and this led to uh, a great deal of debate. Um, uh, different religious groups um, were and still are opposed to abortion, of course, um, but started to mobilize politically. Um, and Roe v. Wade also to, to others, maybe who are less concerned about sort of the moral implications of abortion, but were concerned about the Supreme Court um, overreaching or taking a broader view of what, of what was constitutional. Um, so you see some, some divide there between uh, the left and the right. Um, something that's not controversial now, but really was in the 1970s, um, were also the, the emergence of no-fault divorce laws. Um, prior to this, um, in most states, to get a divorce, you had to sue the other party for divorce and have evidence of some kind of particular wrongdoing, whether it be neglect, um, cruelty, um, abuse, or adultery. Um, very few places could you just get a divorce because you were unhappy and did not want to be married to this person anymore. Um, one of the first states to do this was uh, Nevada. Um, so if you watch old movies um, about people like going to Reno to get a divorce, this sort of became a trope because Nevada was one of the only places um, you could do that uh, in like the 1940s, 1950s. So you had people going, establishing residency and getting divorced in Nevada. Um, uh, but increasingly other states sort of adopted this. Um, for many people um, who were unhappily married, this was great. Um, for others who are more who were concerned with what they saw as the erosion of American family life, um, divorce was something that they felt was was threatening um, to family stability, um, and again, in some cases, immoral um, from some people's perspectives. <clears throat> 
Um, we also have other advances um, in the women's movement, the equal uh, employment through Title VII, which I spoke about in the video over the weekend of the Civil Rights Act, made it illegal to discriminate based on sex, um, but it needed to be enforced. Um, and that came through with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC. Um, <clears throat> In 1969, it had probably one of its first um, uh, large successes when 46 women who worked at Newsweek magazine sued the publisher um, for lack of advancement opportunities and won. Um, other uh, advanced sort of symbolic advances for equality in this period included uh, the Battle of the Sexes tennis match between Bobby Riggs and uh, Billie Jean King in 1973 and uh, uh, King uh, won that match, um, you know, protesting that um, <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a symbolic mean to say that, that female athletes were uh, as good, if not better, uh, than male champions. And then finally, uh, though you are going to read a lot more about this on your own, uh, a note that the Equal Rights Amendment went to the states for ratification in 1972. Um, it had been presented before Congress every year since 1923. Um, and it finally passed through in 1972. However, with a caveat that it had to be ratified within eight years. Um, and that, that limit um, placed on the ERA um, sort of led to this, um, led to a um, debate um, or a, a campaign uh, both for and against it. Um, <clears throat> Phyllis Schlafly became the face of the movement of arguing that women um, were against the ERA um, and uh, against losing sort of traditional privileges similar to the arguments against the ERA when it was first written uh, in the 1920s by Alice Paul. Uh, also the environmental movement um, got started um, in earnest in the 1960s, um, in some cases uh, with concern about uh, health. Um, historians of medicine have sometimes talked about this as a, a revival of an environmental perspective in medicine, um, including the quote by John Burnham on the screen. Um, so Silent Spring, uh, in Silent Spring, Rachel Carson, who was a biologist and naturalist, um, pointed out the effects of toxins in the environment, in this case, largely DDT, um, which is an insecticide widely used to kill mosquitoes. Um, however, it bioaccumulates in larger animals um, and can lead to, to malformation of, birds, of the shells of, of bird's eggs and, and other um, toxic effects uh, in the environment. And by the 1970s, uh, decades of pollution and industrial pollution meant that the world seemed pretty gross and dangerous, um, perhaps all best symbolized by the 13 times the Cuyahoga River caught fire in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, this image is, is, is from 1952, but this was an event that happened on occasion between the 1950s and, and all the way back to the 1860s uh, from oil and gas pollution in the waterways. <laughs> Um, other kinds of environmental pollutants that started to get a lot of attention um, included lead. Um, studies of lead poisoning in children in the 1970s uh, showed Scott startlingly uh, high lead levels in large numbers of children. Um, lead was in gasoline, so people would inhale it, particularly in cities, um, as well as readily available in paint. It, those, those environmental leads started to be removed in the 1970s. Uh, Deleading of gasoline was completed by the 1990s. Uh, but there are still a lot of uh, lingering problems, for example, in older homes uh, from lead paint that wasn't properly sequestered. Much of this led um, to the first observance, of, first observance of Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970. So we're coming up very quickly on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, and again, particularly with uh, pollution during this period, uh, the environmental movement had widespread support um, across, uh, across the aisle and uh, environmental legislation passed pretty easily uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, EPA was created in 1970, as well as the Clean Air Act. The Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. 
um, and the Clean Drinking Water Act in 1974, all limiting um, uh, the ability of polluters to pollute. Other challenges, however, were economic. Um, Deindustrialization accelerated in the Northeast and Midwest, which had already been starting. Um, this was a uh, this loss of high wage manufacturing jobs was compounded by the beginning of large scale factory automation. So technology increasingly putting people out of work or making what had been um, highly skilled jobs into unskilled jobs and, and therefore um, uh, lower paying. And the moving of cheaper and more uh, factories to cheaper and more business factory at business friendly areas. So low union participation, low taxes, low regulation. Um, some of this started as early as the 1920s with textile manufacturing moving out of the Northeast and into the Southeast. Um, and continued through the 1970s of a movement um, first to the South and West. Uh, and by the end of the 1970s, uh, the beginning of outsourcing to countries with uh, fewer regulations. So it's the end of the highly progressive tax codes of the era of affluence. So progressive in the sense that um, if you had a very high, as you in, as your income increased, your tax per, the percentage of that income that was taxed um, steadily increased as well. Um, and we start to see the beginning of of a uh, of, of return of the trend of income inequality. Also increased oil prices and energy embargoes um, started as well throughout the 1970s. And we'll speak more about those next week. Um, this is just a for you as a resource um, on the Watergate uh, scandal. Um, you can look through this at your leisure, but just again to, to emphasize that Watergate happened both very quickly and very slowly. Um, some of the behaviors, including wiretapping, conspiracy, uh, burglary, <clears throat> um, uh, that uh, tie into Nixon start all the way back in 1971, um, when the administration started to be really very worried about, um, about leaks. So the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg, a reporter, um, <clears throat> or Dan, Dan Ellsberg, who, who worked uh, in the government, leaked the Pentagon Papers in 1971. They were printed by the New York Times and Washington Post. Those papers detailed um, the fact that the Kennedy and Johnson administrations had been consistently lying about uh, the severity of the war in Vietnam and the level of American involvement, which led to serious backlash. Nixon was not implicated in the Pentagon Papers, but he was really concerned that it, that something like this could happen as, at all, and and uh, <clears throat> uh, started to con be concerned about leaks. Um, heavily uh, prosecuted Ellsberg for leaking them, um, and sort of starts this um, uh, sort of his this tape recording system. Um, to keep uh, tighter control on information inside and outside of the White House. That kind of attitude directly leads to this break-in at the DNC headquarters um, in 1972 um, and the administration getting involved in the investigations. So this is where um, <clears throat> uh, Nixon himself gets in trouble for things like obstruction of justice, for halting an investigation, um, for firing prosecutors um, to try to slow down um, what was happening. For the American people, this led to uh, a both the Pentagon Papers and then uh, Watergate especially, a lack of trust over the government and serious concern about uh, the power in the executive branch. We will continue to talk about all of this um, uh, next week.